Hello and welcome back. With this update we have five more locations to visit. The first one being Luther Tenny. Let me tell you, a murder, even by a 4,000 year old mummy, was only one odd thing in a string of bad luck on this voyage. What sort of bad luck? It all started with the crew, really. Seamen are a rather superstitious lot to begin with, and the idea carrying about a 4,000 year old mummy had them shivering in the timbers. We almost faced a bloody mutiny. Then there were the passengers, a strange lot. I can tell you that reporter fellow, Travis, did us no service at all with his mystic mumbo jumbo. He and Professor Winderbank had a regular war of words going on about whatever powers this mummy was supposed to have. And there was the two Arabs. Arabs? Interesting. Do you recall their names? I should hope I do. One was called Fahmy. He always carried around this curious little box. No clue what was in it, but Fahmy never let it out of his sight. The other one's name was Al Saad, and he spent most of his time lurking about watching Fahmy. My guess is he wanted that box. Sounds like you had your hands full. I haven't even told you about the fight yet between Mr. Weatherby and Mr. Aruburu. Over what? Weatherby's wife, I'd say, though they were a tight-lipped lot about it. I see. Tell me, Lieutenant, we understand that you were the first person to discover the body. Yes, sir, I was. Captain Ramsey sent me down to inspect the hold. And I went immediately over to them Egyptian crates. Professor Winderbank was particularly anxious about him, you know. Could you describe the scene as you remember it? I'll never forget it. I just made my way to the back of the hold, and I noticed that the top of them crates, the one what carried the mummy's coffin, was raised up kind of funny like. The coffin lid was laid off to one side, and there was Mr. Weatherby, all sprawled on the floor next to a bowl of ashes. He'd been strangled by a length of the mummy's sheet. Bloody gruesome, I tell you. Poor bloke's eyes popped out like a couple of sausages on a hot iron skillet. Quite a vivid picture, don't you agree, Holmes? Quite. And you reported this to Captain Ramsay straight away? Absolutely. In fact, the captain put me in charge of the entire investigation. And what did you discover? Did anybody have any contact with Weatherby on the night of the murder? Not that I know of. I could account for all the crew. And the passengers were in their cabins, as far as anyone knew or would say. Nobody saw anything, heard anything, or knew anything. And besides, Weatherby was seasick from the beginning. He stayed pretty much in his cabin all the time. Maybe that's why the lovely young Mrs. Weatherby was gallivanting about. With Uruburu? Yes, indeed. And what of the bowl? Where is it now? The bowl? With the ashes. Oh, yes. You know, now that you mention it, I don't recall ever seeing it again. Next up is H.R. Murray, who had the same amount of votes as London University. Pettigrew wrote this book over 50 years ago, and there's still nothing better on the subject. Fascinating. Just fascinating. And what can I do for you today, Whitson? It's Watson, sir. Watson, yes, of course. We're interested in what you may have learned about this mummy case. Oh, so these days it's mummies you're chasing down with that fella, Helms. It's Holmes, sir. This is what I said now, isn't it, Whitson? Yes, I believe you did, sir. Uh, let me show you what I found so far. This is the bit of linen that was found round the neck of James Windebank. I examined it thoroughly and it is quite old, perhaps thousands of years. However, it is not the murder weapon. Are you certain of that? Aye. The linen is quite old, but it's not at all strong enough to strangle a grown man. Very interesting, sir. I also found something quite fascinating. Uh, take a look through this glass. Uh, do you see those short hairs on the fabric? They look precisely like hairs. Of course they look like hairs. But what kind of hairs? They're not human hairs. They're dog hairs. Now, look at this. This piece of linen 
was found round the neck of the victim on board the ship. Well, his name was Leatherby or something. Uh, it is also quite old, and on it I found more hairs. More dog hairs? No, my dear man, monkey hairs. I've not yet been able to identify the precise species, but it's just extraordinary, isn't it? Quite. But what do you think it all means? Well, I'm not the sort who likes to jump to conclusions, Whitson. But I can assure you that neither of these bandages were the murder weapons. Such a tragedy. Fine men all and such outstanding scholars. I still can't quite get over the shock of it. We understand. Professor, we're looking for background information on these three men so that we can understand how their murders might tie together. Well, let me begin with Dr. Turnbull. Ebenezer Turnbull was responsible for organizing the Carterbed expedition. Quite a remarkable man, really. This was the first time he teamed up with James Winderbank. Professor Winderbank was one of our most popular lecturers. In fact, several of his former students were also eager to accompany him. I recall him saying that he was having difficulty choosing. Weatherby turned out to be the lucky one. Though it seems far from it now, doesn't it? I suppose Smith and Travis turned out to be the lucky ones after all. Smith and Travis? Peter Smith accepted the invitation to join another expedition. As for Philip Travis, he was quite keen on accompanying Professor Winderbank. In fact, he became exceedingly upset when Andrew Weatherby, a postgraduate student in the department, was chosen instead. Took it rather personally, I should say. Turnbull was mentioned, and that's who we will be visiting next. Dr. Turnbull, he was a strange one, he was. Are he ever at home? Always traipsing about her Lord knows where. May I take a look at his things? Oh, suit yourself. All he had is a big pile of books about Egyptian mummies and a few maps. He was a son of an earl, he was. Though you hardly tell from looking at him, poor fellow. Do you really think this mummy thing's what's done him in? Creepy, I says. <laughs> Okay, and the last person on the list is Mr. Henry Ellis. It's quite amusing all this hoopla over a mummy's curse, I must say. Not so amusing, of course, the murder of three Englishmen. Have any of your reporters uncovered anything new? Actually, I've been in Paris the past several weeks. Just returned to London on Tuesday. I've had no involvement with the writing of any of these articles. I believe they are all the work of Philip Travis. He's one of our young reporters. For a short time, he was the Egyptian correspondent. Was he sacked? No, no. He returned to London just a few days ago. I gather he was reassigned to cover the case from here because he had some familiarity with the murder in Egypt. Do you know Travis? No. Never actually met the chap, although I hear he's a bit of an odd duck. Thanks for your help, Henry. Anytime. Let me know when you catch the mummy. That's one scoop I'd like to get. <laughs> and there was a vote to send the irregulars. Uruburu got voted out. But there was one vote for Sir Jasper Meek. And there we have it. So let's go over the evidence again. And that is it for this update. 
I believe that we have enough evidence to take this to the judge, but it's up to you to decide that. You just need to work out who did the murders and why, or you can continue voting to visit other people. It's up to yourselves. Anyway, thank you for watching. Take care. Goodbye.